at a time when humans must really radically change the way our needs are met uh, or face extinction, it seems really important to incorporate ecofeminist insights about the politics of care into a transition to a post-carbon future. And many ecofeminists are calling for the kind of fundamental restructuring of society that entails organizing social reproduction in a new way in order to make the work of our daily survival less onerous and more enjoyable and, and democratic than we have seen under capitalism so far. And these are not new demands. They've been made repeatedly and have been made countless times over the decades precisely because eco-political thinkers and activists don't bring an intersectional approach to thinking about environmental justice and eco-politics. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, a podcast series that tackles some of the big questions in the field of environmental politics for university students in Canada. I'm Peter Andre from Carleton University, co-host of the show, along with uh, Dr. Ryan Katzrozine from the University of Ottawa, though he's not joining us for this episode. Today's podcast is about pluralism, ecofeminism, and queer ecology. To introduce this topic, I just want to talk a bit about my own path into ecopolitics. Towards the end of my undergrad in the early 1990s, I was really taken by the big question of how did we get into this environmental crisis in the first place? And what does that mean for the work we need to do to respond to it? As I wrestled with this question, I came to see that there are many different ways of answering it from different perspectives, each of which can carry some valuable insights. My own thesis work led me to engage with early ecofeminist writers like Carolyn Merchant, who wrote an amazing book called The Death of Nature. I came to see that we can't make sense of the environmental crisis without understanding the power and impact of patriarchy in our lives. That is, the values, relationships, and institutional structures that have subordinated women to men, and which have also placed the rest of nature in a subordinate position in relation to a very particular instrumental and exploitative rationality associated with patriarchy in Western history. Um, I won't go too much more into that now because I'm hoping our guests can help unpack this a little bit over the course of this episode. I do wanna say though, that I came to realize that we all, regardless of our gender and position, we've all paid a price for this patriarchal system we are part of. Um, though I fully recognize, of course, some pay a dearer price than others. Uh, a simple example can be found in what Laurie Adkins said in another episode in this series in which she pointed out that uh, there's a very particular masculinity associated with focusing only on drawing raw bitumen out of the ground in Alberta, and which refuses to see as equal the potential economic and social benefits associated with jobs in the energy retrofitting industry. I believe we all have a lot to gain by getting clarity not only on how gender is connected to environmental exploitation, but also racism and heterosexism, for example, how these things continue to shape the way that environment is understood and engaged with. So there's so much to learn and think through when taking these issues seriously as we try to make sense of environmental politics. So I'm really excited about the conversation we're gonna to have today in this podcast with Professor Catriona Sandilands and Dr. Sherilyn McGregor. Catriona, or Kate Sandilands, is a writer and scholar in the environmental humanities. She's Professor of Environmental Arts and Justice in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University. Her research sits at the intersection of feminist and queer theory, multi-species studies, especially plant-human relations, and the interdisciplinary environmental humanities. She's written or, or edited several books, among them Queer Ecologies, Sex, Nature, Politics, Desire, co-edited with Bruce Erickson. Sherilyn McGregor is reader in environmental politics, jointly appointed to the Sustainable Consumption Institute and the Politics Department in the School of Social Sciences at the University of Manchester in the UK. The focus of her research is the relationship between feminist politics and environmental politics, particularly around issues of sustainability, justice, citizenship, and unpaid care work. She has written or edited a number of books, including the 2017 Rutledge Handbook of Gender and Environment. So, as I said, one of the things today's episode is about is taking pluralism seriously in ecopolitics, a topic Ryan and I first introduced in our opening episode. In that episode, we discussed the importance of recognizing that any narrative 
environmental politics is inevitably grounded in both the positionality of the storyteller and an epistemology, a set of assumptions about what counts as legitimate knowledge. Sometimes positionality and epistemological assumptions are foregrounded in the story, but often they're cleverly hidden within relations of power that seem to predetermine whose voice has more authority than others. So for the first question, I'm going to turn to uh, Kate Sandilands. Kate, in one version of your faculty profile at York University, you stated that your primary task as a teacher, writer, and researcher is the cultivation of plurality. What do you mean by the cultivation of plurality, and why do you think it's so important when it comes to efforts to address environmental issues like climate change, for example? Thank you very much for the question, Peter. The idea of the cultivation of plurality begins in the assumption not only that we all have different relationships to environmental issues such as climate change or indeed issues such as COVID, but that there is a real merit to discussing those issues uh, in common in ways that acknowledge and uh, really acknowledge respect and proceed from our very particular uh, positionalities or situated knowledges uh, in the world, as Donna Haraway would say. Plurality is, is not the same thing as everyone has the right to their own opinion, which is, is uh, in my opinion, not a very sensible phrase. Uh, an opinion is not something that one has a right to. An opinion is something that is grounded in experience of the world, uh, everyday experience of the world. So I have a particular situation in relationship to climate change. I see particular things. I experience different particular things. I am affected in particular ways. That's not the be all and end all of environmental knowledge. As opposed to a model in which we are presented with climate change as a, a fact or a process, or uh, particularly the idea that we are all somehow in the same boat. The idea of the cultivation of plurality means that we, we start from our individual understandings and bring them to the table in common so that we are able to hold our different knowledges of the world accountable to one another. So in a way, the idea of the cultivation of plurality is the idea that we bring our situations to the table and discuss their relationships rather than assume that we are all, all proceed uh, to understand or act in relationship to environmental issues uh, from some kind of position of sameness. Sherilyn, uh, much of your scholarship focuses on gender and the environment. For example, you've written a book grounded in an ecofeminist analysis entitled Beyond Mothering Earth, Ecological Citizenship and the Politics of Care. What does ecofeminism mean to academics studying the relationship among people and between people and the environments they live and work in? And what has adopting an ecofeminist possession come to mean in your own work? Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's great to be with you in this um, podcast. Uh, by way of introduction, I'd start by saying that ecofeminism is a body of environmental political theory that has been developing over the past 40 years or so, first in environmental philosophy and ethics, and then expanded and elaborated in, in various ways by scholars in different disciplines, sometimes using different labels, such as feminist political ecology, and feminist ecological economics. Um, and I think it's important to point out that ecofeminist work in the environmental social sciences is probably somewhat more relevant to um, in students of environmental politics, and it's also where I locate my work. But I'd also want to note that there's a lot of important ecofeminist work being done in the environmental humanities, in, in English and literary criticism, cultural studies, post-humanist philosophy, and so forth. Um, so that being said, um, I think also, I think I want to say that I'm going to talk about academic ecofeminism. And it's important to say here that academic ecofeminism is very diverse and transdisciplinary. And what I'm presenting here is a view from the global north. Um, and I'd want to stress that many, uh, that there are many different interpretations and practices of ecofeminism around the world. So Indian ecofeminism as articulated in, in Vandana Shiva's work, for example, or the ecofeminisms being practiced by anti-mining activist women in South Africa have very specific histories and features that I can't cover here, but I think that listeners should definitely be aware of. 
That said, I would explain ecofeminism as a critical theoretical lens that focuses on the many ways that gender as a construct shapes how people see and treat nature, as well as people's interactions with their environments. Um, Ecofeminism takes as a starting point the fact that humans are embodied beings embedded in relationships whose survival depends on other humans, other species, and the more than human world. It's very critical of the Enlightenment ontologies and epistemologies that you spoke about in the introductory podcast, Peter, when you referred to the Cartesian move of treating mind and body as separate or or as hierarchically ordered. And ecofeminist thinkers see these binary structures of thought, mind and body, as well as the, the dualisms of culture, nature, and male, female, as root causes of the ecological failings of Western culture. Um, In a very early essay from around 1990, I think, uh, Inestra King set out some of the foundational claims of ecofeminist political theory and wanted really to define it as neither antisocial nor anti-natural, but fundamentally anti-dualistic. Um, So it's a perspective that understands humans as a species that emerged from and being as embedded in the material world. And it calls for, in King's words, treating this ontology as a ground for ethics. And this leads not only to a radically different view of humans, but also leads to ecofeminists to advocate and interspecies politics that recognizes nature as having agency. Now, you might want to um, say that a lot of branches of eco-political theory are critical of enlightenment dualisms and the structures that they make possible, like capitalism, technoscience, and colonialism. Um, Ecofeminism is certainly not alone in seeking more just interspecies politics. But what makes ecofeminism specifically feminist and what ecofeminism brings to ecopolitics that no other approach brings, I think, or perhaps queer ecology also brings, um, is that it makes visible the gender norms, relations and asymmetries that shape human experiences of environmental processes and change. It says that dominant gender norms of masculinity and femininity and the structure of patriarchy are intertwined and entangled with capitalism and colonialism, and they must be treated as such. Um, They must be analyzed as such, not least because we won't be able to adequately tackle the root causes of the current crises unless we understand how these crises are interlinked and mutually reinforcing. And here, of course, I'm thinking of the crises of capitalism, climate, care, and now COVID-19. Thank you, Sherilyn. I, uh, I recognize that was a really big question I asked you, and uh, I, I think you've done a really nice job of, of sketching out the broad contours of this uh, field of ecofeminist uh, political thought, and then uh, also positioning the particularities of it as a sort of a feminist environmental political theory. Um, I want to turn back to Kate now. Uh, Kate, my understanding is that in your own scholarly development, the notion of queer ecology built on your engagement with ecofeminism. In the collection Keywords for Environmental Studies, you begin your introduction to queer ecology by stating that this term refers to a loose interdisciplinary constellation of practices that aim in different ways to disrupt prevailing heterosexist discursive and institutional articulations of sexuality and nature, and also to reimagine evolutionary processes, ecological interactions, and environmental politics in light of queer theory. So there's a lot to unpack in that one sentence. That's why I put it out there for us to think about. Uh, For listeners just hearing this term for the first time, how would you describe the core threads of queer ecology, especially as they relate to what we broadly think about in this series as ecopolitics? The central tenets of queer ecology are that experiences of sexuality and gender identity are also influential in shaping one's relationship to the natural world 
In the introduction to Bruce Erickson's and my edited book, Queer Ecologies, we thought about that in three ways in particular. The first is that ideas of nature are very strongly influenced by heterosexist and homophobic formulations. So, for example, although this is now beginning to change, um, and there are many evolutionary and other biologists who are speaking about sexual diversity in the more than human world, there was for a, a very long time an assumption that the, the natural form of uh, mammalian, at least, sexuality is heterosexual, and anything other than that must be some kind of deviation or that the display of non-heterosexual behavior or homosocial behavior uh, must somehow be part of the larger practice of heterosexuality in a given species. So uh, in uh, bonobos, for example, a species of primate, there was a reading of female homosocial behavior as this must be a way of cultivating cooperation among the females so that they could choose which male they were going to mate with. That sort of uh, overwhelming assumption of the fundamental heterosexuality, the importance of heterosexuality, completely overlooked the fact that these bonobos might actually be having fun with one another. So the, the first key tenet of queer ecology is that heterosexuality and homophobia have been profoundly important in shaping the ways that we think about nature. The second is that heterosexuality and homophobia have been incredibly important in shaping the institutions through which we experience nature. One of the most obvious is the park. Central Park was actually designed in a very particular way in order for appropriate rituals of heterosexual courtship to occur. And then what happened in the, uh, the other parts of the park, which might not have been so respectable at the time, for example, places for uh, sexual contact were actually criminalized. The parks were specifically organized to develop heterosexual behavior and discourage homosexual behavior, which was then criminalized. The third tenet of queer ecology is that uh, LGBTQ2 plus writers are actually able to not only get us to challenge those, those heterosexual uh, mindsets and institutions through which we understand uh, and experience nature, but also that queer writers might be able to show us ways of, of, of thinking and behaving that are not so tightly tied to these heterosexist ideas and specifically institutions around uh, family and inheritance and consumption that go along with dominant uh, models of the middle class, particularly middle class nuclear family. Um, although um, th this, is, this is a very complex topic, and I don't mean to suggest that queer ecology is somehow anti-family, um, the idea that, that futurity might not be tied to inheritance, the idea that consumption and um, amassing of wealth in the nuclear family might not be the best way of thinking about property, about cooperation and thinking about, and about family um, is actually what is actually a very key insight that, that queer ecology has brought to the world. What does it mean to have intimate, deeply connected relationships with a family that includes not just other human beings, particularly not just biologically related human beings, but also the more than human world. Thank you, uh, Kate. I realize <laughs> that was also a very big question for you. And, and thank you for uh, really laying out some of the key insights that have been emerging uh, in from by queer ecologists, uh, particularly around how uh, heterosexism and homophobia um, has shaped our understanding of nature, has shaped the way we uh, build our cities and institutions and parks, as an example. Um, and then some of the insights that you were getting at in the end, I think, are really interesting uh, as we think about the future and the insights that queer ecology can bring to uh, who we are and who we need to be moving forward, uh, hopefully as a, as a more inclusive society. Um, I'm going to turn back to Sherilyn. Uh, Sherilyn, in a chapter you published in the 2018 Rutledge Companion to Environmental Studies, 
You noted that uh, just as the environment did not enter popular discourse until the late 1960s, the importance of gender in human societies was popularized in the global north, north only as recently as the 1970s. Notably, both terms relate to movements for social change, environmentalism and feminism, respectively. Was there a larger uh, cultural shift in perspective that these terms are part of, in your view? Yes, I think it's 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 good to think about a kind of cultural shift and that these movements are part of a cultural shift and, and their key words, gender and environment, are part of this kind of discursive and cultural kinds of kind of shift. Um, you know, thinking about it through what Ulrich Beck has called reflexive modernization, um, which is a process or that he certainly theorized as a process that took place um, or in the time you know, around the second part of the 20th century, where citizens started to question and to doubt the idea of progress and the promised benefits of modern science and technology. Um, it became sort of, I mean, it became increasingly apparent that human well-being and conditions of ecosystem integrity are, were under threat from, from some of the very things that were meant to be improvements in, in people's lives. So like synthetic chemicals, uh, pharmaceuticals, nuclear technologies, and so, and so on. So movements started to form to start to challenge the authority of hitherto trusted institutions and to call them to account. Um, so people wanted to question the accumulation of chemical herbicides and pesticides in the ecosystem, for example. They wanted to question the prescribing of drugs to healthy women by a largely male medical profession with almost no understanding of women's bodies. And it all started to make sense through social movements, through politicizing these industries, these professions, and connections were made, right, to profit, to power and ideology. Of course, these political movements mobilized to try to foreground these connections and to make them something that, that needed to be challenged and eventually changed. Um, of course, it seems rather odd to look back and celebrate people questioning scientific expertise in the current context. Um, but um, I've always thought that uh, this reflexive modernization narrative is quite helpful in thinking about the cultural shift that gave rise to feminism and environmentalism in the 60s and 70s in North America and Western Europe. And it's certainly, uh, I think, a better one than the standard and sometimes we think of quite flawed post-materialism thesis. Kate, I wonder if you want to uh, add something to what uh, Sherilyn's just been saying. Thank you. Um, this idea of reflexive modernization actually is um, possibly a useful way of distinguishing queer ecology from what many listeners might understand as the primary orientation of uh, a lot of uh, recent gay and lesbian politics um, advocating, for example, for marriage equality. Um, on the one hand, we see what some call a, a move uh, toward homonormativity in which um, a rights-based agenda for LGBTQ people is that uh, we can have all the same rights as, as heterosexuals so that we can have the right to marry, we can have the right to uh, be the beneficiary on one another's life insurance policies. And while I don't want to negate the importance of those basic rights, queer ecology is not necessarily interested in having the same uh, rights uh, the same institutions, the same practices as heterosexual um, uh, nuclear families, um, as, as heterosexual institutions. Rather, queer ecologies seeks to critique those institutions for their environmental impact. So queer here is deployed as a critical term um, rather than a term that uh, demands uh, a certain kinds of rights-based equality. Thanks, Kate. That's uh, really helpful. Uh, and, and Sherilyn, too. I found it was really interesting, you know, to bring in reflexive modernization and then, and then this, this uh, point that Kate was bringing up about uh, the distinct positionality of, of, of queer ecologies in uh, perhaps uh, bringing up a, a, a stronger critique of uh, the, the 
assumptions one might hold about uh, simply wanting to make uh, open up the heterosexist institutions and p- perhaps make them uh, it, it's not just heteronormative but also homonormative and uh, you know that queer ecology is really fundamentally wanting to challenge uh, the assumptions about what it means to open up and be a more inclusive society um, and so Sherilyn I wanted to ask you I mean maybe you want to respond to what uh, Kate just uh, said but also just to reflect on how these uh, social movements have interacted over the almost uh, 50 years since. Uh, And particularly, uh, do you think environmentalists and the environmental movement and maybe environmental policies makers uh, have taken gender more seriously over the years in their response to environmental issues? Uh, and, And similarly, has the feminist movement become more environmentalist as these movements have uh, connected? If you don't mind, I want to start by making my answer a little bit closer to home to what I, where I work, which is looking at academic uh, environmental politics circles, and then say something about the movements and policymakers. The two have a, a pretty um, odd relationship, and I actually wrote an article, I don't know, probably about 10 years ago now, which I call them natural allies and perennial foes. Um, and, you, you know, you would think they would work quite well together, um, or, or at least I do, because I work at, at, in a way that brings them together. Um, but in reality, there's a lack of engagement and um, a level of misrecognition that I found quite frustrating and, and baffling uh, over the years. Um, and if you take environmental studies as an academic field, there's a well-documented lack of attention to gender and feminism. Uh, in environmental social science, um, certainly with with environmental politics as as a discipline that probably fares worst of all. Um, And you can actually look at some journal citations um, or sort of do a search of journal citations to sort of find evidence for my claim. Um, There was a a study by, uh, in 2007, by Banerjee and Bell, who um, presented results of a citation index search where they looked for references to gender, sex, or feminism in um, the top five environmental social science journals from 1980 to 2005. And they found just 3.9% of citations in these journals had any references to these key terms of gender, sex, or feminism. And an exact rerun of their study uh, was done by one of my PhD students uh, Joanna Flavel uh, last year, and she found that that figure uh, could be updated to a whopping 4.4%. Um, so that's a pretty shocking uh, lack of attention um, to feminist insights, feminist theorizing, feminist research within the environmental social sciences. I've recently done my own search within environmental politics, which is the you know the, one of the top journals in our field of eco politics, um, and I've tried to look at you know what the situation is there. Um, and and actually, eco environmental politics journal is is um, celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. And if you look back over its 30 years, um, eco feminism was first introduced in the journal in its first. in in volume one, issue two, back in 1992. A few years later, it was praised by John Barry uh, in an essay um, where he called it a a materialist theory that suggests nothing less than a fundamental rethink of green politics. And yet since then, since about the late 90s, it has really faded into the margins. And uh, I did a search um, about a year ago through the back issues of environmental politics and found a total of 11 articles um, where ecofeminism is central and about five where it is only mentioned in a kind of superficial way. So the evidence of lack of engagement uh, is pretty overwhelming. Explaining why why there's a lack of engagement is not something I'm able to do. I can speculate, but I'd rather do a bit more research to be able to explain, but it's definitely worth uh, pondering. So that's the academic situation. Um, 
there might be um, a better level of productive interaction and engagement between feminine, feminism and environmentalism within social movement and policy circles. Uh, but I would venture to say that a lot of um, a, a lot of work by feminists um, has gone into putting gender and intersectional analysis on the green agenda. Um, and 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 then not a lot of effort has been made on the part of environmentalists to go along to feminist conferences and protest and say, you know, hey, what about the climate crisis? Uh, women's movement organizations have tended not to focus a lot on environment and climate. It's often because they've had more pressing strategic priorities. Uh, and a good example of this is to illustrate this is um, a couple of months ago, I was invited to give a, a talk on, on the gender dimensions of the climate emergency to um, a South African feminist NGO network. And a few, a few, well, like a day after I was invited, they said, oh, sorry, no, we're going to cancel that because we actually want to have a, a talk on male, on, on male violence um, during the pandemic lockdown, uh, because this is far more ur- urgent for our our members and for our, our practitioners in the different um, NGOs in the network. So that puts, you know, that puts the politics of this into bold relief, doesn't it? I mean, women are being killed in their homes every day while vast swaths of the planet are on fire. You know, how do you prioritize? Um, so, but, you know, in the world of academic feminism, um, there has tended to be a lack of attention to environmental issues in part due to choices to focus on different sorts of gender-related questions like violence, um, but it, and also in part perhaps due to almost outright avoidance of environment out of fear of being seen as essentialist or uncritically aligned with biological nature. And there's a whole critique of the feminist flight from nature that, that Stacey Alimo has, has written about, which I think is still worth uh, understanding and, and, and appreciating, um, even though we might want to be extremely critical of it. Um, and then there's a third part, I think, of why feminists have tended to not engage so much with environmental issues. And that is possibly due to the domination in some disciplines um, uh, and fields by a brand of liberal feminism that advances the narrow interests of elite women in ways that just sustain capitalism, colonialism, white supremacy, and other isms. And just very quickly on on the policy piece of this, uh, because you asked about um, the extent to which, uh, you know, feminism and and environmentalism speak to each other in in the policy terrain. And I often think that the the policy often seems farthest, further ahead on gender and environment than, than, than movements and certainly than academia. Uh, tends to be. And here, much of this is the result of feminist activists who have fought really hard for some small gains along the bumpy road towards transformative structural change. And we could look at the the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, for example, goal number five on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. We can look at the UNFCCC, which has recently adopted a gender action plan. Um, and various NGOs and governments that are engaging in what they call gender mainstreaming or the mainstreaming of gender as a as a as a concept uh, into environmental and climate policies. Um, so we can see some gains in in that in those respects, but but that comes with two really important caveats, however, and the first is that these policies can be very instrumental. Uh, they can treat women's empowerment as a useful tool for 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 system sustaining responses to climate change. And the second is that they really t- almost ex- you know exclusively equate gender with women uh, to the complete neglect of men in most cases and probably all cases. I, I'm yet to find many examples where where gender is treated as um, the way that feminists would want to treat it, as an intersectional uh, idea that in, that it's that is a, a spectrum that includes masculinities as well as femininities. Thanks, Sherilyn. Uh, that was, uh, I have to say, somewhat sobering um, to hear that uh, the field of environmental politics has uh, engaged uh, so little with 
these these very important questions of gender. And and we heard a similar uh, analysis in a previous podcast uh, looking at environmental racism, where the field of environmental studies was uh, not open to these questions of race until only very recently. And yet, um, I mean, I just have to say, I'm so glad that we're including these episodes in this particular series and uh, that students, you know, hopefully the future will have more of this type of uh, work taken seriously in environmental politics, uh, because it certainly is, for, for all the reasons that we're talking about today, so important to making sense of the environmental crisis and how we may respond to it. Um, on this question, question of uh gender and environment and how it's picked up. I'll just turn back to Kate. Um, you know, Sherilyn, you've also written about this, um, that there's a, a substantial body of literature, maybe not in environmental politics, but beyond that on women environment, but much less on men and environment. Um, and that this imbalance has also led to a rather simplified assumption that when scholars and activists talk about gender and environment, we're basically referring to women and the environment. And one consequence of this simplification is that queer and two-spirited LGBTQ plus people and their experiences and perspectives on the intersection between gender, sexuality, and environment get very little attention. Kate, for a number of years, you've been teaching a course called Sex, Gender, Nature to undergraduate environmental studies students at York University. What are the core ideas that you hope students take away from this course about sex, gender, and nature, maybe building on the, the ideas from the, uh, the book that you talked about earlier? And how do these ideas matter for how, why do these ideas matter for how we address the environmental challenges of our time? First, um, I need to say that um, I, uh, my, my perspective, my, my work um, is currently very strongly grounded in the uh, environmental humanities rather than the environmental social sciences. Um, however, I still write about politics. I think it's very important to, uh, to understand and emphasize that politics is not limited to policy. Um, and that there are multiple sites for the enactment of politics and engagement with political work, um, and that the the humanities and the arts uh, are actually deeply invested in thinking about the cultivation of plurality that is necessary to the development of um, a real environmental political consciousness. So um, I'm I'm also uh, sobered by the fact that uh, we're still only 4% of articles on ecofeminism, but I would point to the proliferation of works in the arts and in literature that very strongly articulate gender and environment. Uh, One example that I can think of off the top of my head is Margaret Atwood's uh, Mad Adam trilogy, uh, Oryx and Crake, The Year of the Flood and Mad Adam. Throughout these three novels, which are incredibly popular, uh, there's a very, very strong and deeply political analysis of the relationship between patriarchy and uh, oppressive gender relations, sexual violence, and the destruction of the natural environment. It's not framed in terms of policy. It's framed in terms of uh, getting getting the reader to uh, understand the relationship between those two very large and violent sets of processes through um, through their experience of a fictional world. So in response to your specific question about the sex, gender, nature class, um, although I do teach um, an interdisciplinary array of, of works, uh, including policy, including social science, my fundamental orientation is getting students, male and female and other, to understand um, through reading works of literature to to see to be able to see the world around them in terms of these these dense knots of gender and environment. Uh, so gender and environment is not just a relationship that is articulated in in a particular set of places. One cannot have a relationship to the environment without being gendered in some way. Gender in the environment is an, is an everyday relationship. So how, how to see that, how to understand that, how to be able to recognize it, an everyday moment uh, in which gender is shaping one's relationship to the environment 
in a way that might lead to, uh, in, in a moment that might actually act as a, as a moment of transformation. For example, Chris Cooper um, and his experiences of racism uh, in relationship to a white woman um, in Central Park. Uh, you might remember that he is the, uh, the the birder who filmed a woman accusing him of something that he didn't do simply because he asked the woman to leash her dog. And it blew up and it became a very powerful moment to think about um, how uh, black men, uh, in this case, a uh, queer black man, um, how um, their experience of space is so heavily organized by experiences of race. Um, I would also argue in that particular moment that you can see the operations of gender going on. This is a moment in which it's, it's very clear that racial politics were going on, um, that racism was going on, but you can also see very clearly that that racialized interaction was also deeply gendered. It's very important to speak about masculinity. It's very important to speak about black masculinity as an intersectional relationship that that clearly shapes um, perceptions of and relationships to natural environments. My goal is to to help us create um, the analytical tools to show these very deeply political moments in which it becomes absolutely obvious that these are having an effect on the way that people are interacting with one another in and about the natural world. Thank you, Kate. It, I, um, first off, I really just want to say thank you for opening up our conversation about what is politics. And I uh, completely agree with you that art, literature, films, and, and the everyday is, uh, is the political as well. And I'm glad you're kind of opening that up for our listeners in this Ecopolitics podcast. Um, and I think your example of Chris Cooper in the end and talking about the intersectionality to help analyze his experience and uh, for us all to see that, I, I, yeah, it's, it's a great example. And with that, I just want to turn to Sherilyn because you were using the word intersectionality earlier on as well. And I wonder if you could um, maybe just talk a little bit about how you understand intersectionality and what it means to bring an intersectional approach to uh, your environmental policy or activist work. Um, I think our listeners would be really interested in hearing about your recent work on the proposed uh, Green New Deal for the UK and at the international level through the Women's Environment and Development Organization. Uh, This idea of a Green New Deal as a package of policies and programs designed to address both the climate crisis and economic inequality is a topic we've discussed previously in the podcast series with Bob Pelkey, uh, but with a focus on the United States and Canada. What does it mean for you to take an intersectional approach to conceptualizing something like a Green New Deal? Um, well, maybe I can start uh, by briefly trying to explain what an ecofeminist approach to intersectional analysis looks like before going on to talk about how we've tried to use it in our work on the Green New Deal and the feminist Green New Deal. Um, I guess I'd to say that feminism is a praxis that is striving for social justice, for gender justice, um, and it understands power relations and injustices as having, you know, material, structural, normative, discursive dimensions, and 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 as operating on multiple levels, and as being lived, uh, expressed, and reproduced through all sorts of social practices. So it's it's very complex, right? Um, And intersectionality is a kind of way of naming and working with this complexity. It's an analytical tool, really, that that's the way I think of it. Um, It's it's an analytical tool that shows how structures of power emerge and interact. Um, And and feminist theorists of of many different uh, persuasions uh, and, and, and approaches use intersectionality as a way of analyzing specifically the interactions between gender, race, class, sexuality, age, and other categories of difference um, in, in people's lives, in their social practices, in institutional relationships and arrangements, uh, in cultural ideologies, as well as sort of the outcomes of these interactions and how 
in terms of how power is distributed um, socially. Um, of course, this concept has an origins in black feminist theory, and it needs to be always you know, attributed to the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw and, and shown that it builds on work by theorists such as Angela Davis, Bell Hooks, Patricia Hill Collins, and all of us, including ecofeminists who work in feminist theory, acknowledge the importance of this work in showing that gender is always raced and always classed. It always intersects with other axes of difference. So intersectionality is, is needed um, analytically and politically in order to avoid simplistic and single axes understandings of gender. But at the same time, I want to also say that it should, should and it can and should be used to understand the way axes of power and privilege intersect to position um, some people as if they are completely unmarked by these categories. Um, so white, cisgender, male, straight, affluent, um, you know, these, these, this, const, this sort of intersection of certain axes can actually be more relevant to thinking about um, environmental problems and the causes of environmental problems um, than thinking about the, 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 about the socially marginalized, you know. Um, so I think it's wrong, it would be wrong to think about intersectionality as only about the intersections of different forms of oppression. It's also about the intersection of different forms of power and privilege. Um, I would also add that um, that while ecofeminist political theory analyzes the intersections of ident identities and positionalities of humans in the pursuit of social and environmental justice, it also seeks to bring species, matter, culture, climate to the analysis. Um, and that kind of intersectional analysis and intersectionality has not necessarily been as normalized in mainstream feminism or ecopolitics. Uh, it's still kind of very much under development. Um, and I mean, I think that's what ecofeminism has always tried to do, but actually using the term eco intersectionality and using it as an analytical lens um, is, is, hasn't been uh, uh, developed as, as, as clearly. And that's actually a really um, an excellent article that I recommend. One of the few uh, articles on gender and ecofeminism in, that was published in Environmental Politics um, by Anna Kaiser and Annika Krunzel that looks at climate change through the lens of intersectionality. And I think, you know, your listeners and students should definitely have a look at that article to see how intersectionality can be applied to environmental political issues more broadly. And your other part of your question, right, is, okay, how do you bring intersectional approach to thinking about this, you know, topic du jour, uh, Green New Deal? Um, so in this, for the sake of time, uh, maybe I could just um, flip that question on its head and talk about what happens when Green New Deal plans and, and proposals are developed without an intersectional analysis. Um, and that's where my colleague uh, Maeve Cohen and I started when we wrote our paper on the Green New Deal in the UK, which people can read online and maybe they'll, they'll have a link to it. Um, but we started looking at a ra the range of existing plans for a Green New Deal that have been made by different political parties and think tanks and just started asking questions. What's missing here? What assumptions um, underpin these policies? And, and then we started to, to, to look at what's missing, ask those questions, and then start to craft a response about what a feminist Green New Deal would, would look like. And we wanted to really show how key analytical insights into intersectional power relations and, and questions about distribution of money, time, work, and responsibility are rarely, if ever, addressed uh, in Green New Deal uh, proposals. And as a result, there's every chance that Green New, these Green New Deal proposals um, will result in a smaller number of, of a small number of winners and a great many losers. Um, so asking who wins, who loses, who pays, who profits, who does what work and for whom, and what axes of oppression and privilege intersect to create these winners and losers is really part of an intersectional approach. The interlocking crises of our time, right, climate and now COVID, have shown us how capitalism utterly fails in times of crisis. And it fails because 
It is really great at commoditizing and exploiting life and the work that sustain, sustains life and really bad at valuing and protecting life and the work and the workers who sustain life. So this is important to, to make that point because in recent months, the Green New Deal has, is being rebooted to be all about a just recovery, right? Building back better after COVID. And there are many feminists and eco-feminists, especially in the UK um, right now, who are really united in their argument that a just recovery has to be a care-led recovery. Uh, and, and, and making those arguments, we really want to shift the focus of Green New Deal policymaking away from its narrow obsession with energy and, uh, you know, and, and transition via green technologies and jobs in these rather select construction and engineering sectors, which, by the way, happen to be dominated by white men. The arguments that are being put forward by ecofeminists and feminists working in this is and that what we tried to put across in our policy document is that care work is green work. Care jobs, jobs in the care sectors are green jobs. And that this work is already being done disproportionately by women, racialized women and racialized men, and it is poorly paid and unpaid. At the same time, it is absolutely essential for the economy, for, the, for a good quality of life and for the decarbonization agenda. And the fact that care work has tended to be ignored in mainstream Green New Deal visions is a result of a lack of an intersectional analysis. And that means that they just really aren't very good. Thank you, Sherilyn. Your examples really show how an ecofeminist intersectional lens, um, the, the value it brings to policy work, uh, in the same way that uh, Kate's example previously showed uh, how this intersectional approach can really allow the politics of the day to day to to become apparent to our eyes. Um, Kate, before we close, I'd also like to ask you a question about some of the implications of what we're talking about today. Uh, bring us back to our opening discussion about pluralism. What does it mean to take the insights of ecofeminism and queer ecology seriously in how we imagine and operate public spaces like Canada's national parks? I'm interested uh, in thinking about public spaces uh, and public institutions and public practices uh, as sites in which to highlight questions of intersectionality. From, from my perspective, intersectionality is, is more of a, a way of describing the, the complex embodiments of our daily lives than it is an, an analytical, than, than it is sort of an abstract uh, analytical construct. How is it that public texts, public institutions, public spaces, such as, but not only national parks, uh, how, how is it that we can actually understand the, the specific relations that we bring to those, uh, to those publics, to those institutions? And how is it that we can think about form, forming alternate publics uh, that might um, enact uh, perform, expose, uh, rebuild sites of environmental conversation th that are not dominated by a cis white male uh, a perspective, which of course never appears as a cis white male perspective. It appears as a universal. Uh, national parks in Canada, at least, and, and probably in other settler colonial states as well, are institutions that, uh, again, in which certain kinds of uh, public gets performed. So uh, in, in parks, you're supposed to do particular things, you're supposed to um, uh, to, to behave in particular ways, you're supposed to learn certain kinds of things about the history of the of the city um, or, or the nation. You're supposed to learn certain kinds of things about nature, uh, and these uh, these things are presented. Uh, as, as universal forms of knowledge, often very nationalist forms of knowledge, so that the story that gets told about the nation in the national park is actually designed to give people a certain idea of their citizenship. Um, but art and art and literature and performance um, can can politicize those those institutions and can can show uh, in the case of national parks, for example, the relationships of racism and colonialism, uh, as well as heterosexism and sexism on which they're built. The current recognition that national parks 
uh, are actually nature institutions that are built on the active exclusion of, of First Nations, of Indigenous, of indigenous folks um, in Canada, um, is, is actually highlighted by, by many recent works of art by Indigenous artists. Uh, but just to, to bring it very specifically back to queer ecology, um, I wanted to just talk very briefly about a performance piece by uh, Shauna Dempsey and Laurie Milan and Banff National Park called Lesbian National Parks and Services, uh, which I, I encourage readers to Google because there are bits of the performance uh, available online. Um, Dempsey and Milan uh, dressed in warden's uniforms and they created a mock interpretive experience that used the grammar of park interpretive guides uh, as a way of highlighting the invisibility of queer history uh, in the park space. So they were handing out maps that would show people the invisible lesbian house and the unmarked site of a particular sexual encounter. They mocked and therefore politicized and opened up and made visible the dis discourses around sex, gender, nature, race, um, in which the national parks are steeped. So again, um, back to the point about politics does not only happen at the level of policy. Uh, policy, the, the vast majority of politics doesn't get um, codified in normative uh, prescriptive documents. Uh, politics also uh, critically and crucially happens in everyday experiences and everyday encounters. And that's the kind of, uh, of, of queer ecological work um, that I have tended to focus on um, and that, that, that many queer ecological writers working in the humanities have also focused on. I want to uh, thank you both for uh, what's been a really stimulating conversation for me. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think about some of the key takeaways that I'm taking from here. Uh, one, you know, I really appreciate, uh, Kate, the, the multiple ways in which you encouraged us to really open up our conception of the political. And yes, it includes art and literature and parks and the day-to-day -day encounters that we have in in our lives and and you've really brought some great examples forward to uh, to bring those points home um, secondly this notion of pluralism as uh, critical to a fulsome uh, democratic discussion there are so many points of view that need to be uh, given credence and uh, uh, allow to have their voices participate in thinking through where we are at at this uh, historical moment in our uh, catastrophe uh, with the earth and uh, where how we need to come out of this and how we need to uh, see ourselves and this planet as we move forward and the viewpoints that came forward today uh, and there are so many more are, are so important to those discussions and so Finally, I, I, what I take from uh, both of you, but in particular, uh, Sherilyn, is this uh, a call to action within by scholars and students of environmental politics uh, that we haven't taken um, gender uh, and intersectionality uh, as that relates to gender, uh, race, class, uh, uh, sexuality. We haven't taken it seriously enough yet in understanding uh, the environmental crisis and thus in thinking through how we are going to and how we are responding to it uh, through public policy, uh, through the economy. And uh, I, I think you've brought that point home very clearly for me and I, I hope that listeners uh, take heed and that the, the next generation of environmental political work is going to look different from what some of what you've described as the last, uh, what's been coming out in the last 20 years uh, in this field. I want to thank you both so much for being with us today. And this wraps up another episode of the Ecopolitics podcast. Don't forget to check out other episodes in the series at ecopoliticspodcast.ca uh, and like us on social media. We're on Twitter at ecopoliticsp. You can also share your feedback with us through the contact form on the website. Thanks once again to our guests and we'll talk to you in our next episode. Thank you.